Okay, so now we are in business, as I like to say. Um, at this point, I want to focus on a specific case, the case of Ayik, um, but also just generally talk about more about how scholars have dealt with the body, the issue of the body, but also to kind of give you a sense of the uh, certain... I'm not sure even how to exactly frame it because this is these are new some of the slides here I've used before but this is kind of a new way of organizing the material so just, just entertain entertain me here basically I want to kind of give you a feeling of different um approaches to old Norse um disability so uh, medieval disability so um this is from a saga important text you all hopefully know if not then you probably uh, didn't go to Mentascoli, I guess. I don't know. Um, okay, so um, this is a description from the end of the saga when they find a, its bones. Under the altar place, human bones were found. They were much bigger than other people's bones. People figured from what old folks said, folks said that these must be Eil's a, a, a bones. It's very hard to combine English and Icelandic. Uh, Egil's bone. Egil's bone. Um, Skafti, the priest, Thorarinson. Skafti, the priest. I mean, Gothi, but then that seems a bit weird. No, Skafti, the priest. Sorry. What? Okay. Skafti, the priest. Eh, sorry, I thought it was uh, Snorri. Yeah. Uh, Skapti the priest Thorunenson, an intelligent man, was there at the time. He picked up a yield skull and put it on the church wall. The skull was amazingly large, and it seemed beyond all likelihood how heavy it was. The skull was rigid all over like a scallop shell. Skafti was curious about the thickness of the skull. He picked up a big hand axe and swung with one hand as hard as he could and struck the hammer end on the skull, trying to break it, as you do. That's my addition. Uh, but it only whitened where it was hit <laughs> and neither cracked apart nor shattered. And it may be inferred from this that the skull wasn't fragile under um, the blows of insignificant men while the skin and flesh were still on it. Eil's bone, Eil's bones were buried outside the churchyard wall at Mosfetk. Okay, so um, this description is quite interesting and it invites apparently a medical model um, interpretation. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm operating under the assumption that you guys understand what I mean when I say the medical model, you know, kind of like trying to diagnose, retro, retrospectively diagnose this character, because if you diagnose him, if you diagnose eight, maybe you'll understand what was wrong with him all this time. So Jesse L. Biok, very, very, very important, old Norse uh, historian slash literary scholar slash archaeologist, you probably know him, if you don't, he's kind of like the Jörg Glauser, uh, if so, Jörg Glauser in Switzerland, the German-speaking countries, uh, wrote the textbook. In Iceland, you have several people. Uh, so he's like one of the um, uh, English-speaking, more like American-speaking uh, American uh, version of Jörg Glauser in Germany, I guess. Good old Jesse Bayok. He, um, he argues that the characteristics, the physical characteristics that are described here could actually indicate Paget's disease, uh, which kind of enlarges the bones like this and um, may explain some of his behaviors. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe it could be, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't, um, in, I mean, I have never looked into it deeply, but the point is that my point is that in this case, he's really going for a medical model interpretation. And I mean, he made a lot of, um, um, made a lot of arguments to support this. And he also, he was really looking for a skull and a its body. And he found, um, 
a grave where Aid's body used to be, but there wasn't a body there. So that, that indicates to him that the body was moved. I mean, it makes sense. Long story short, there's a lot of um, signs that there was something historical maybe about this character. I mean, this is a story about someone that maybe existed at some point, but uh, <laughs> one argument that, uh, I mean, maybe I'll touch upon later, but uh, Louis Bragg talks about, and I'll introduce her in a second, is how it could be that Skafti found a skull of a person with Paget, Paget's disease and thought this person must be a it. So kind of like this retrospective logic that she kind of says. Um, yeah, I'm giving here two more examples of um, the medical model applied in Old Norse research. Um, later on, I'll reference uh, Christopher Crocker's very useful bibliography, but since I already mentioned it, you really should check out Christopher Crocker's very useful bibliography on these topics. He has a lot of articles, medical model, social model, uh, religious model, whatever, um, discussing disability in the Old Norse texts. Um, okay, so yeah, so you can check these out. Um, I want to talk about Anna of Sayers, and actually I, I've listened to an old recording of mine. I, I spoke about her probably like 40 minutes. I'm going to try and cut it down to 20 minutes, not because she doesn't deserve uh, all the respect, but rather because I just talked so much about her. So I'm trying to condense it. Um, I don't know if you guys read the chapter I gave you. Um, sorry, again, guys, I don't know if you y'all read the chapter I gave you. I do recommend reading it because it is quite fascinating. And Nadeth Sayers has a very unique style, and that's the quote here that I want to read to you. Um, her style, so first of all, just to clarify, she used to be called Louis Bragg, and then, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I think sometime in the 2000s, she changed her name from Louis Bragg to Nadeth Sayers. Um, so, I mean, but she's still kind of like, you know, she, she acknowledges her past name. It's not something that she kind of... Uh, denies. It's just that she has a new name now. Uh, if you want to see her work or website, it's ednathsayers.com, something like that. Just Google or, or Ecosia Ednathith Sayers, and uh, you shall find her website. Um, so her style, it, it really does remind me of Irina Metzler because there's this kind of element of urgency in her writing, like Irina Metzler, but different because Irina Metzler writes very, very, very connect, a lot of citations, a lot of uh, reference to other scholarship, a lot of responses to other scholarship. And then the stairs takes the other route, which is uh, she doesn't reference that much other scholarship. There is reference sometimes, but mostly a lot of the stuff is kind of almost like a stream of thought sometimes it feels, but a very good stream of thought. Uh, there's a lot of folklore elements there for the um, social sciences folk um present. Um, a lot of folkloric elements, a lot of really interesting elements in the writing, but it is very challenging. So it, it's it's like a book that you can just pick up and eh, what, what uh, Edith Sayers had to say about hey, Saga. Well, yeah, you're not going to find it that way. Uh, you'll have to, well, I mean, you know, maybe you will, but you'll have to really go deep into this text in order to completely understand it. Um, but there's a lot of treasures there and it is worth reading if you explore the sagas more depth. So um, just to kind of illustrate her style, a quote I really like, uh, these cultural norms of behavior and physical appearance not only vary widely from society to society, but also change over time. So again, something we've talked about a million times already. In fact, they are adjusted every day to compensate for changing demographics and technology. Across the street from my house lie the buildings of the oldest public lunatic asylum in the United States, funded in the, in the 1860s when the lunatic poor included what today we call epileptics, non-English speaking immigrants, and middle-aged women with hot flashes. When new drugs and new attitudes made it cheaper and easier to treat such people off-site, or leave them untreated, 
the empty campus was converted to a minimum security drug rehabilitation center, which now houses young men too poor or ill-educated to have hired an effective lawyer when they were found to be in possession of minuscule amounts of recreational drugs. These youths have replaced immigrants with a penchant to urinate in public places and frustrated menopausal housewives as the current menaces to public decorum. So you see from this already how much she's here to make a statement. She's here for activism. She's here to you know show that everything is relative. Um, and, and she does it very effectively. Um, so uh, yeah, just seeing if there's something I didn't mention. Yeah, I should note that she is these days a deaf scholar. Um, she... <laughs> Yeah, she wasn't always, I mean, she was a deaf study scholar, but now she's a deaf scholar, it's a different, as some of you might know, different uh, category, I guess. Um, yeah, well, for, for reasons, <laughs> she uh, transitioned into deaf. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's the term, and I apologize, but the idea, uh, was she became deaf. Um she, yeah, so the book that I assigned you reading from, and hopefully you've read, but uh, yeah, it's uh, Oedipus Borealis, The Aberrant Body in Icelandic Myth and Saga. And she makes some important points that I do want to dwell on, which is that this is a book about men, that the sagas, uh, they do deal with women. I feel like you do get a feeling of how women's lives were, but it is many ways you get much more detail about men. And women are understood, according to her, again, as disabled women. I'm not sure I agree with this. This is very Carol Clover uh, kind of argument of, um, you know, uh, the so Carol Clover said that there's only one gender in Old Norse society and that that gender is a man, basically. And if you're more of a man, then less of a man. So... A woman is just less of a man and a disabled person is less of a man. So a disabled man is less of a man. So, yeah. So I, I think that's kind of like what she's referring to. As I said, she doesn't use a lot of footnotes. Maybe she does there. I, I'm not sure. I feel like she must have quoted Clover, but yeah, I'm not sure if she cites her there. Um, the important point is that she really brings in a lot of information. She talks about Oedipus the Tyrant, uh, Oedipus Rex, that you might know. Um, and she has a lot of, um, she makes a lot of folkloric connections. Again, not in a very scientific way, as in she doesn't really use a clear methodology, but she finds a lot of fascinating connections. So um, she talks about the marked foot, right? The marked foot and asocial behaviors as a characteristic of founder figures. Um, and to this, she connects child abandonment, complication with paternal inheritance, patricide and incest with mother. So all this sounds familiar from Oedipus, but it also sounds familiar from other texts. Uh, child of abandonment sadly appears a lot in the sagas. Um, when I say abandonment, it's very often exposure, you know, uh, leaving the child to die in the elements, um, and then complications with paternal inheritance. Very often in the sagas, people have to kind of prove their um, belonging to their social group. Um, patricide, killing the father, um, that happens less in the sagas, but there, it does happen. Like this kind of, a, especially in A saga, kind of he kills a man called Eyit in his youth kills a man called Grimur, who is very clearly supposed to be a representation of the father. He also kills a man that is supposed to be a representation of his brother. He, he kills a lot of people that are supposed to be his family members. Um, yeah. I'm not going to edit that out. Um, yeah, so um, and on the other hand, there's also blindness and clairvoyance. Um, so yeah, the fact, you know, Oedipus where he takes off his eyes, uh, removes his eyes in, in anguish. And then in the sequel, he becomes this uh, great prophet in the Sophocles play. Um, yeah, so she finds all these connections in first in Greek myth, well, first in Oedipus, then in Greek myth, 
then in Old Norse myth, which is the chapter that you read, and then in Old Norse saga characters, like Eyjik. Um, Yeah, so as I mentioned here, um, yeah. So she also says that the, the negative associations that we have with disability is a modern or a Christian construct, but she also says that the fact that uh, that the texts that we have from the sagas and of course the mythology are all uh, are all um, written by passed down to us by Christian people. So that's what we have in a way. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, I really don't want to spend too much time about her, but there's just a lot of interesting stuff she says. Uh, so this is, I swear, I cut down like half of the PowerPoint slides connected to her, but it's still a lot to say about her. Eyit, um, so she ties Eyit Skatlegrimson's uh, body, his aberrant body, as she calls it, with, so again, you know, the, the body described by... Um, Bioc as Paget's disease. So she ties this with his um <laughs> uh with his creativity, the fact that he's kind of like a founding figure for Icelandic uh identity, right? He's the second vol the second volume of Islands Fornrit. Uh, this is a I'm holding a Islands Fornrit. This is Haukun Sara, but you know, um second volume of Islands Fornrit um is Saga, the first one being Landnamabok and Islandigabok. So this is a very inform, uh, important text. You'd expect Mjall Saga, but that's number 10, which is also a very symbolic number. Um, that Eyjit is the quintessential Icelandic founder hero and is ill-featured and outsized at one at the same time is a keystone, is the keystone of his character. Again, um, Talking about Rebecca Merkelbach's social monstrosity, this concept where someone's um, disruptiveness is embodied, maybe um, in their someone's disruptiveness in society turns them into a monster. But the berserk, the concept of a berserk, which is actually a something that might have existed, and there's a lot of debate about that, but this kind of description of someone who doesn't belong adding to them this description of being a berserk being like transformation either physical transformation like shape shifting or mental transformation um so the oversized body of the berserk with sexual urges that are very often seen as disruptive the the berserk very often goes into a farm and demands the wife or the daughter and then the farmer has to fight them and is usually killed. Sometimes someone intervenes and is killed or, or actually manages to kill the berserker. Um, so, uh, yeah, on the other hand, you have the grudging and murderous dwarf smith um, who, yeah, she describes as asexual. I'm not sure that's entirely correct. The, the thing about the dwarf is that... It's not entirely clear that the dwarf of the old Norse myth was necessarily the dwarves of Tolkien. These, you know, people with uh, dwarfism, um, as they are described, not very clear. I, I really like this movie, um, Infinity War. Is it no, Marvel? Sorry, Avengers: Infinity War End Game. It's called End Game, right? So yeah, so sorry, Marvel End Game and. <laughs> In that movie, uh, there is Peter Dinklage, who is a person with dwarfism, and he plays a dwarf, but he's giant. So I thought that was, I mean, it was a shitty, oh, sorry, it was a very bad scene, whatever. He wasn't a good, I mean, he's a great actor, but he didn't really, that role was kind of silly. But I thought it was genius um, in the sense that he is, he has embodied difference, but he's not small. So that's kind of like how you sometimes feel about um, what dwarves might have been in the perception mythology. So again, like I said, she reverses uh, Bayek's argument about Paget's disease. Eyit, the, the, this skull that uh, our good friend Skafti found stood out, and therefore people thought that that one was actually um, Eyit. And 
She writes, uh, Biox's assertion reveals our own ages medical model, which admittedly, I mean, I think even Biok would say that he was diagnosing, I mean, he literally was diagnosing <laughs> Ayat. I uh, want one last quote from, yeah, wow, okay, I didn't manage to do it 20 minutes. <laughs> However, the connections between poetry and Ayat's um, aberrant features are obvious from the discussion in chapter one. For one thing, poetry, like smithing, is an example of metis, sorry for butchering Greek here, cunning knowledge. The poet and the smith, as we saw in that discussion, are alloforms, alloforms, who share a cluster of features, including leg anom anomalies, marine associations, ugliness, and so on, for another, as we saw in our discussion of Thersites, Thersites, the poet in traditional society is assigned a role as an aberrant, aberrant outsider which frees him to comment more trenchantly on the foibles of the society and its leaders. Ayik is so much the outsider that he composes for patrons only under extreme duress to save his head and is typical of the saga scalds in not being part of a king's entourage as Thersetis is. Yeah, okay. Um... I wish that uh, you could respond to me now and tell me if something was unclear. But, um, I mean, you can tell Hannah Björk and I will respond. I can always record another thing. You know, it's uh, this technology is not ending in the minute that I stop recording. It was very hard for me to realize how to record this, though. But I think now I got it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I do want to show, and maybe uh, some of you are old Norse scholars, or and you've never heard of this book. How isn't how is it that I never heard of this book? Well, um, here are some explanations. I already mentioned that she's not strong with citations, and not very strong with using secondary literature. So one thing that does she does do. <clears throat> very well is uh, well <laughs> that has been pointed out about her is that she doesn't do that so this is a quote from mcr uh, margaret clunius ross one of the most important I, I, I wanted to say like not avant-garde like uh, one of the most for, uh, prominent old norse scholars <clears throat> originally australia well originally australian and she writes about this text about uh, in a book review. So I, I people don't really appreciate book reviews, I think, as much as they should, as I'm a big fan of book reviews. I think we can learn a lot from book reviews and how people receive texts. Um, it's never nice as an author to read a book review. Luckily, I haven't published a book yet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I'll stop writing book reviews after I write a book. So. It's in-your-face character and its sporadic engagement with the research field upon which it depends and to whose practitioners it would be meaningful indicates that its impact is likely to be small. It is hard to see a general audience following the detail of Bragg's argument, while her scholarly colleagues will become impatient with such a disregard of the state of contemporary and past scholarship. Yeah, it is a very hard book to read through, and I'm sure that someone who does not know much about the sagas might find the saga parts especially hard to read, and someone who doesn't know much about the sagas, uh, sorry, does know much about the sagas would be sometimes somewhat uh, flabbergasted at a lack of a certain citation. I mean, this is 2003. There's quite a lot of scholarship that had been written at that point um, about the sagas. Um, yeah, and then there's also a response, uh, I'm not going to go into it now, uh, from the perspective of a disability studies scholar. Um, you can pause and read. <laughs> you can also read the whole review if you want online. Um, if you cannot find anything, please contact me and I will send it to you. Now, oh yes, I wrote wrong. Yes, uh, <laughs> that, yeah, uh, she writes, yeah, uh, it's very, uh, yeah, uh, it's it, what she says there is very inaccurate. The, she as in um, the reviewer, not 
Louis Brat. Yes. Okay. So um, I want to dwell. So like I said, I was kind of wanting to go through some of the scholarship that has been written about <clears throat> uh, Old Norse. And one important scholar is John Sexton. Um, his article, Atypical Bodies. Um, and I do want to I do want to dwell on his quote here. Um, a further difficulty insurmountable in the course of a single chapter or volume is the variety of experiences of this ability across a millennium and several continents. Continents. Even within a single cultural and chronological um, <clears throat> context, we cannot speak of the experience of the able or disabled, typical or atypical nor can we with any confidence speak of the medieval response to the atypical body. The idea of a single medieval approach to disability or even a universal understanding of what constituted an atypical body is beyond reductive. Again, the idea of bodies, right? In nearly all cultures, the meaning of an impaired or atypical body was contingent. Missing teeth in one person indicated a sufferer of scurvy. That was the word with the nose, scurvy. Um, another, a disease of the gums or teeth. Another, a survivor of violence or an accidental fall. Similarly, a missing leg may indicate a congenital condition, a disease, an accident, or violence. And a full communal response to the absent limb may hinge on an agreed-upon Inter on agreed upon interpretations of the absence. Once again, an idea that keeps coming back and back and back is the fact that the body is <laughs> the body is a canvas. There's this quote that my wife really likes to cite, uh, I, but I don't really remember it. Your your life, little girl, is an empty page on which men will want to write on. That's from Sound of Music, and my wife always refers to that. Um, when I talk about my, you know, what I write, um, I even tried to incorporate it into something that I wrote and hopefully we'll make it. Uh, also, Despacito has the sentence, treat your body like a manuscript. Basically, the fact that we write on the bodies of people. <laughs> write, you know, like mentally. Um, long story short. Anyway, uh, yes, um, I hope the point was clear. And again, feel free to ask Hannah if you want me to uh, clarify something. <clears throat> Another um, quote by John Sexton. So I, I just, his scholarship is very, very complex sometimes for my head. So I feel like any paraphrasing I might do will do him an injustice. Um, so that's why I chose to just give the quotes. Thor of Twistleg, who's bully ragging of an elderly man is implicitly contemptible, is twisted by his reputation as much as by his limp. His afterlife echoes his actions in life as his animated... So this is a character from Ace, from Eirbyge Saga who haunts people and kills them and stuff. Um, his afterlife echoes his actions in life as his animated corpse terrorizes the neighbors and drives them off their land. His twisted body is neither a symptom nor evidence of a twisted man. It is a convenient metaphor, a visual metonym for his socially unacceptable and non-normate personality. Basically, you know, in, in Greti Saga, there's this character, uh, mm, is it not, not Thorolbur? Usually I have that text, but I decided to kind of cut it out today, unfortunately. Um, there's a guy with a, with, with a name. Um, <clears throat> it was called Trilo. Uh, Ununder. Ununder. Yeah, what I said. Yeah, Triefot. Um, and he also has a tree foot. I mean, well, not a twisted foot, but a tree, a tree foot and then uh, as tree leg. And yet he's, um, he's uh, seen as a very heroic character. There's nothing uh, about him missing a limb that makes him contemptible or something. A few references to it, but nothing uh, that makes him negative. So what basically John is saying uh, is that 
yes, they use the twist. If I understand John correctly, as I mentioned, he's genius. I find it hard to wrap my head around everything, but um, the um, the body, the, the 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 characteristics of his character are 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 represented in his body but it's not it, but another person could have a leg that has been damaged by some fight or something and not be treated as negative and that happens in the saga very often so it's a convenient metaphor but not a not a sentence perhaps that makes sense um yeah i wanted to talk about our, the article that you read. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole thing now because that is a um, very long argument to go into. Um, but again, I wanted to show, highlight a few scholars that are important. Sean Lewing talks a lot about mutilation, about physical disfigurement. And as we know, the body in Old Norse scholarship is... Um, very often in, in the sagas, you know, very often uh, hurt or, or uh, impaired as a cause of war because of all the fighting that happens, which is something that um, John Sexton talks a lot about. But Sean Lewin talks about mutilation as an intentional cutting off of limbs or uh, plucking out of eyes and this kind of stuff. But in this case, the place of evil, what he talks about is abandonment of children. And he's dealing with this question of did people abandon children? Like, right, there's this myth in the Middle Ages about the Middle Ages that they would abandon children in cases where they would be born with some disability or with some impairment. And he problematizes that in many, many ways. Uh, you've read the article, I hope. Um, so the concept of changeling, that the elves come and replace the child, uh, I think in Welsh tradition, it's it's a fairy, but um, so a, a heathen monster that must be cast out from the Christian community. The idea that this baby with with um, embodied difference should be considered somehow a monster. Again, talking about monstrosity. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go. I mean, you read the article. I think the main point about this article that I wanted to highlight is the fact that again we're questioning the question we're questioning the issue of the dark ages yes there were cases where certain phenomenon phenomena that weren't necessarily a disability a person that is born for instance uh with a block that they can't breathe um when they're born is not necessarily something disabling these days or an, an impairment these days like you I'm, I'm not i'm not a doctor i mean i am a doctor but not that kind of doctor but these days there's ways to solve that kind of issue um but in those days that was not the case in those days uh that would be some that would be a death sentence basically to the child and that's why you would expose it if it could not breathe um yeah so uh Towards the end, he does use a bit of a medical model, but he does this very critically of himself. And he says, uh, though the medical model discussed above may yet conflate notions of impairment and disability, Old Norse law texts do not provide conclusive evidence that birth defects per se were a source of fear. The reason he uses a medical model is because he wants to diagnose and realize, is it even true that they would expose children with impairments? And... He makes it clear that it was not always a case. I mean, just think about it. Person is born with ID, with intellectual disability. You don't know that until a certain stage. And when a child is, I don't know, two months old, you're not very likely you're not going to expose it to the elements. Uh, you've already created an attachment. And there's the character very well known of, uh, oh, I forgot his name. I just know his nickname which is not nice um so i'm not gonna say it because i feel it's disrespectful but in gisli saga, in gisli saga sursunar there's a character who's referred to as the as the fool of his father um and he is remains a kind of like um 
tied to a chain to kind of protect him um, or protect his kind of, uh, protect his, uh, well, protect him or protect his uh, family from him and whatnot. But the idea is that even in this case, he is not exposed. Um, now there's someone saying, I, I remember there's an argument, I, I didn't address it in this PowerPoint, but someone saying that maybe he wasn't exposed because he was the only child of, of him. I mean, maybe, yeah, but it could also be that he wasn't exposed because by the point that they realized that he has an intellectual disability, they got attached to him. It's hard to uh, kill someone you love, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think this is, uh, oh no, you know, I, um, I'll finish this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to drink this water and I will finish the thingy. Okay. Because I want, I want to finish the part about the body. And then we'll take a short break. Well, I mean, not necessarily short for you. Also not for me. You, do. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about finally the topic of the body in Old Norse. So uh, this is from Auslunda saga, which is already a bit of a conf confusing saga. Is it a Fortnala saga, as in is in a saga of the legendary times of the times of the Vikings, or is it a Riddar saga? Is it a saga of knights? It kind of walks the... <clears throat> walks the path of both of them. And there's a case of this um, fellow, King <clears throat> Alvar, who is killed, and Princess Isa, his daughter, Isa, Elsa, mm, uh, she looks uh, for an avenger for her father. Now, there's a man called Avender, who's kind of a not very attractive man for her, and he is trying to court her. She does not want to, uh, she does not want to marry him, but she doesn't know how to deny him because her foster brother, Ausmunder, on the other hand, offers to marry her and she knows that he's a very strong man and he will definitely avenge her father. Uh, so he doesn't know that he's a prince at this point and she can't marry him for no reason. So what she does is she concocts a plan she gathers Avendur and Ausmunder and she says, this one of you I shall marry, said she. Uh, this is a translation by Salakunsa. Uh, this one of you I shall marry, said she, who shows me the more beautiful hands when he returns from Viking adventures next autumn. So the characters look at it in two different ways. One of them is Avendur. He goes to wear, he goes on to wear gloves and hangs out with cooks during um, the autumn. On the other hand, Ausmunder, he goes a Viking. He goes slaying and getting hurt. And I mean, there's no mention of him losing a finger or something, but he fights very well and, you know, just smashes his hands and into the skulls of his enemies and all that. Um, and then there is a passage that I shall read. And here you have the Old Norse very conveniently. Eivindr went forward and asked the princess to look at his arms. Aisa the Beautiful in Fagra uh, said, These arms have been well protected and they are white and beautiful. They have neither been stained by blood nor disfigured by hard blows. Oh, someone's, yeah. Now let us see your arms, Ausmundr, says she. He held out his hands, and they were marked by scars and darkened by blood and weapons bites, wounds. And when, she, when he pulled back his sleeves, they were full of gold rings up to his armpits. Then spoke the king's daughter, this is my decision now, that all in all, Ausmunder's arms are more beautiful slash agreeable, and you, Avindur, are hence excluded from this marriage. The conclusion is that sometimes, so on the one hand, the hands were more beautiful in the sense that they did their function, right? They clearly were um, stained by battle, but also he has all these uh, nice jewelry to kind of make them more pretty. And uh, so they're dressed very nicely, very chic. 
So this combination of these two characteristics are what make um, Ausmunder's hands beautiful. So yeah, um, hopefully the point is clear. This kind of, I called it Icelandic Mr. World, you know, like Mr. Universe or Miss, Miss Universe with the idea of uh, that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder and it is relative. So, uh, okay, now we are going to our coffee break and we will have our last section in soon. <laughs> 